if you will, please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any changes to the agenda to be brought before the board? Seeing none, we will move right into reports. Arkansas Teacher of the Year introduction. So, Miss McAdoo, you going to do that, or Miss? Okay, Miss Hal. All these teachers of the year in the same room. How exciting! Okay, so my job is to officially introduce or present to you our 2020 Arkansas Teacher of the Year, Mr. Joel Lookadoo. Um, he is someone that I'm positive that you're going to love. In fact, I know that you will because I've already heard the excitement from you all and what he will be able to bring to the board. Mr. Lookadoo is a seventh year educator in Arkansas Springdale School District. He has served as a ninth grade Algebra I teacher and an instructional facilitator in mathematics and science content areas. After seeing the college aspirations of former students stalled, he created the Beyond program to provide the added boost to ensure his dreams, their dreams could become reality. Beyond is a college prep program for first generation college students that meet to mentor students discuss college admissions and scholarship opportunities, and prepare students for the ACT who desire to go to college and travel that journey together. To date, all of the Beyond graduates are currently in their first year of higher education. Um, Joel has served on various committees in, in his leadership roles at Lakeside Junior High School, developing and implementing the character education program, piloting and leading professional development on standards-based grading, and serving on the school's Student Recognition Program Committee. He has also facilitate, facilitated regional professional development on teaching English language learners, collaborative and engaging instruction, and building high-performing PLCs. He received his bachelor's degree in secondary mathematics education from UCA and his master's degree in educational leadership from ASU. He also coached basketball and track for three years before choosing to transition from that into being a full-time classroom teacher where he has taught advanced, regular, and inclusion algebra one. He's also certified in ESOL, PE and health, and in building administration. Please put your one hand up in the air, put your other hand up, introduce them to each other as we welcome Mr. Joel. <laughs> so excited uh, to be here and what, what an honor it is uh, to be standing before you uh, as the 2020 Arkansas Teacher of the Year. Um, this is my seventh year in education and uh, most of that being teaching math, uh, Algebra 1 to ninth grade students and I've truly loved it all. Uh, it's been an amazing experience and uh, I'm just humbled with this opportunity. Uh, and I met with 
Justin Minkle a couple of weeks ago. He was the 2007 uh, Arkansas Teacher of the Year and a finalist for National Teacher of the Year. And he said something, he said, uh, you know, people think that you've won an award and what you've really won is a role. And, um, you know, you've, you've, you are the role uh, as the voice for teachers across the state. And that really kind of hit me and gave me some perspective on this because I've heard Stacy and Randy and, and others talk about this as well. And, uh, you know, the questions then start going through my head of how can I be the best uh, representative for teachers in big districts and small districts and urban and rural and suburban districts and uh, you know, across all content areas and grade levels and uh, that's a, that seems like an overwhelming task to do. But we all share one thing and that is students and the desire for uh, students to be successful. And with that, you know, it doesn't matter what the, the skin color of the student is, it doesn't matter if the kid is rich, poor, middle class, uh, it doesn't matter. The ethnic background, the intelligence level dictated by a grade or a test score, uh, what matters is that, that that student deserves a teacher. That student deserves somebody who believes in them. Uh, that student deserves an opportunity to grow and to be heard and to be known. And uh, when a student walks into our schools, you know, they become ours. Uh, they're, they're ours. And uh, that's why I hope to, throughout this process, really empower students uh, by building what I call a winning culture. And that culture is built really on five key elements, and that's relationships, that's attitude and effort, uh, that's excellence, growth, and leadership. And through that culture in our classrooms, I think students feel a sense of belonging uh, students want to be in class, they want to learn, and then the content and the skills that we want to teach fall into place, uh, and they can become the best version of themselves that they can be. And so I hope that my year will be purposeful and make an impact, uh, but I know that it definitely will not be done alone. Uh, I have quickly learned that the best work is done with a team. Uh, and so because of that, I'm excited to learn through this process from all of you on the board. Um, I'm excited to learn from community members across our state and teachers who are doing the work every day uh, so that we can continue to improve edu education across all of Arkansas to ensure that our students get what they need and what they deserve. So thank you for this opportunity. Very good. Okay, next, uh, Ms. McFetcher, do you want to introduce the next yes, one? I'd be happy to. Uh, Dr. Joe Rollins is here this morning. Um, he was uh, instrumental in helping set up the School of Innovation in Springdale, uh, developed a mentoring program for the students at that school, and was principal at that school for several years. Since then, he's moved on to the Northwest Arkansas Council, and I had a chance to meet with him oh, about a month ago, and he shared a uh, program that he has worked on that would really benefit children across the state. So I'm going to leave it at that. He's going to introduce what he's been working on. I think everyone is going to be so excited about this. Joe, I appreciate you coming. Well, thank, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for letting me be here. Uh, like you said, the last time I was in this room, we were doing our best to, uh, to bring forward a new model, make a little history, and... Uh, Thank you all for your support in that. Yes, ma'am, I, I can get much closer. Is that better? The work that I've been doing over the last year, I've really been trying to serve as a bridge between students in all of our programs, K-12, even our post-secondary and our university students, and the arms and needs of our employers. So I've had a chance to work with our chambers, with a little over 1,000 of our employers, most of those one-on-one -on -one at this point. And I've had a chance to really listen to the needs, the concerns. And we're trying now to start meeting those needs, at least on a regional level. We've developed some tools, some analytics, and we're trying to, uh, to bridge that gap to make that a statewide resource. We're not quite there yet, but that work is in place. And I wanted to show that to you so that whenever we talk about career awareness, we have several layers of awareness gap. People talk about skills gap, and yes, I believe that to be a very real issue across the country. As I look at our numbers in Northwest Arkansas, I'm seeing other gaps that concern me. 
in the employer meetings that I have, they're not pushing back on academic preparation. They want to talk about experience gaps, awareness gaps, perception gaps of what those jobs look like, the levels of education that are really needed to walk in and take some of those positions, and then what it takes to grow as an employee once they get there. So I am not an anti-college person at all. As a matter of fact, I'm very pro-college. I have questions about the order and the methods that we do some of that. And I, that's become an even louder concern with me over the last year. That's the conversation that I'd like to have with you this morning. So this is information that I share with students. I've been in all 16 of our regional school districts, most of them several times, trying to spend as much time face to face with students as I can because the real numbers that they need to understand are right in front of you. 549,000 folks as of our most recent census, grown by a little over 52,000 in the last five years, expected to grow by another 40, 42,000 over the next five years. So what does that mean for students? The more students that I meet with, the more convinced I am. On Friday night, we know what that means to go suit up and go compete. I've got that. Do we know what it means to stand and deliver and compete for scholarships, for jobs, for internships, for apprenticeships, for that next step? That's the conversation that I really want to have with students because I see the looks on faces and it's clear to me that we need to work on how do we compete for those kind of opportunities. So that's where this is going. In this work, I've really tried to focus in on four big areas because my work now puts me in the room with employers, with colleges, with technical schools, with K-12, and with adults. We struggle with awareness, but then the age old problem, we have great conversation with students. But then when they go home to talk to mom and dad who like they weren't part of the conversation, the perception may not be there as to what the current lay of the land looks like. So we're battling 20 and 30 year old perception of what our jobs look like. The influence and advocacy piece our employers have been just unanimously wanting to be engaged. They struggle with how to do that. That's one of the, the avenues that I try and open for employers. How can we get you plugged into the process? Because who better to tell the story to our students than the folks who live it every day? The training and experience portion to me is key here. The more employers that I meet with, it keeps coming back to you can't fake experience. We, we need students who are well-informed, who've been coached, mentored, guided, but also have the experience to walk in and understand how to survive when they get here, which kind of lends itself to the apprenticeship, the internship conversation. I hope we can have some conversation about that. But ultimately, the recruiting and onboarding piece. Our employers want to be part of this. You're starting to see hiring day, CTE ceremonies popping up around the state, and I'm very excited about it. Just an easy analogy to use our athletic recruiters. They've kind of had this figured out for a long time. They know how to walk into schools and make students feel like the most special people in the room. I really want to try and help create that same opportunity for our employers and celebrate students who are going to get these jobs. But the population piece for us, we have a very large bubble between the age of 18 and 24 in Northwest Arkansas, a little over 60,000. The bubble behind them is even bigger. So how are we prepping for that? We can't even talk about, we can't even make millennial jokes anymore because now we're talking about Generation Z. Now as a generation, I'm pointing inward at myself, we've left some gaps to fill. We all know what those look like. But our employers are now prepping for a whole new way of recruiting for these students. This is what they're anticipating. Increased levels of social and emotional intelligence, increased comfort with automation, the growth mindset to our employers means something a little bit different than it means to us in educational circles. Educational circles, we can supplement that with you know, lifelong learning. We're going to continue to learn. To an employer, that means you can apply for and even get one of these entry-level positions, but don't plan to stay there very long. We want you to continue to upskill and train and be the next candidate also. We're trying to grow that mindset with our students. Mentoring programs to me, I want to play a perception game for just a minute. If I use the word intern, what kind of jobs typically come to mind? White collar. White collar, entry level. You're going to be the 
coffee getter. You're the coffee getter, the gopher, for whatever the boss tells you to do, right? Okay. Now let's talk about apprentice. What kind of jobs am I talking about there? Newspaper, electrician, farmer. Sure, those skilled trade positions. Let's boil all that down to, to this conversation. If we're going to have this kind of learning model, we're really learning from someone who's been there, done that, and knows the ropes and can coach you through those steps, right? Because I read a great study that talked about the retention differences between interns and apprentices over a five-year period. Apprentices, much higher retention rate because of that adult accountability factor. They have someone to report to, someone to coach and guide and mentor, which led us to some great conversation here in Little Rock with the Center for Data Sciences, uh, Stephanie Isaacs, Cody Waits, all partners in this project for a white collar apprenticeship program that we launched back in September. They helped us work out the funding piece to train up to 400 apprentices in some key areas. And those are data analytics, cybersecurity, uh, web development, and then we're going to start adding to that AI and robotics coding. Uh, they call it power engineering, which is that uh, CAD CAM side of things, trying to really step up the perception of what these apprentice roles look like. And we're lining up employers now to start receiving students after that six to nine week training program. How many of you have high school to college age students of your own? It's gonna be okay, I promise. <laughs> Let me throw some numbers at you. These are real numbers as of this week. I'll, I'll keep the names of some of the employers out of it. We have a training cohort that started this week for the web development side. They're ready to onboard these graduates after a six week training program in the mid 30s. After they complete that year of apprentice work, they're prepared to double that salary to the mid 70s as a 19 year old student. And that's without any further education. What I didn't tell you is they also have tuition benefits there to help these students continue to go to college in the evenings, on Saturdays, whatever it takes. So as a parent who has a student that age, let's let our employers start helping some of our students continue that college pathway if that's what they need to do. So that, that's part of the conversation, but all that stems around awareness. Our students need real-time data, which is what got me here to begin with today. I wanna to show you something that we've been working on. Right now, this is a Northwest Arkansas pilot model. We are working to try and broaden this scope to cover the state. So the website address is careersnwa.com. It was intended to be built to help our teachers. Coming from the classroom, all of our teachers, they cover the curriculum during the day, but they also have an advisory group, most of them. I will say publicly that I believe all of our teachers love their students as if they were their own kids, and they want to see them do really well. Most of our teachers went to school to be subject matter experts. A lot of them didn't go to school to be career coaches, guides, mentors, advisors. But yet we ask them to do that, which I think we should. I also think we should equip them with the best tools that we can. So that's where this came from. As a classroom teacher, I, we took all kinds of career aptitude surveys that led toward all kinds of career pathways, but they failed to zero in on real-time jobs. That's what this site does. So in a minute, one of you who has a high school or college age student, I'm gonna pick on you for just a minute, but resources for students. You're gonna see the application for some of those apprenticeship programs that are already receiving applications. I think uh, in the Northwest Arkansas market, we've got a little, a little under 200 of those already applied for. <coughs> Statewide, I think that number is a little over 1,000, which is great. How do we build awareness? So, under this tab, you can find careers. It's updated nightly at midnight, so it's real time. And just a real quick pop quiz. In Northwest Arkansas, how many open jobs are there this morning as of about 9 o'clock? 15,000. Actually, you're closer than you think. You're a little high. I can show you. About 10,363. And I can tell you who's doing the hiring what the occupations are, who the employers are. Here's that good old certifications and credentials conversation. I can tell you which ones they're looking for by name. <coughs> How about the hard skills, soft skills conversation? We've had that one a time or two. I can tell you which ones they're looking for. 
what the job titles are, what level of education you need to get there. The problem is this is a privately held website that I can't give to the world. But this one, I can. And it's also much more student friendly. So this is the same engine with a student face on it that you can refine all those jobs. So um, I'm, I'm going to pick on you for just a minute because you're close to me. Son or daughter? In high school? Mm -hmm. Daughter. Daughter. Right. What is she wanting to do? What does she like? She wants to be an educator. Educator. <laughs> we, we need more of them. So if she's still in high school, we can refine all those 10,000 plus jobs by the kind of classes she's taking. If she's in college, we can refine it based on the degree she has. If she's still trying to figure out who she is, we can ask some questions about values, beliefs, wants. Or if she wanted to go into the military, we have every SOC code available there that they can look for. I'm for our students no matter what pathway they want to take, but I want them to have the information in hand. So if she wanted to go into education, looks like in the Northwest Arkansas market, I can refine that based on dollar figures or I can base it on how many open jobs we have. So. For a minute, let's say that she wanted to be a secondary teacher. And if she wants to be an elementary teacher, I'll hug her neck. But this is the information that kids are asking our teachers that we need to be able to arm them with. What's the average entry level pay? After a couple of years, what can I expect to make? With some experience, what can I make? And again, all this is specific to the Northwest Arkansas market. We're working to refine that based on larger MSA areas. But what level of education do I need to be competitive? Do I need to go to college? Do I need to go to two-year associate's degree? Do I need a six-week six training program? Depending on what job you pick, that conversation becomes very real very quickly. You know, in the Northwest Arkansas market, we're looking at that master's degree, at least a bachelor's degree. But what does the employment future look like? As a parent, let's talk about job security. This is information that parents need to know. So I can show you all the way out through 2030 what the forecast is where the rubber meets the road. Who are the employers who have jobs posted today? Here they are. Are there specific job ads you want to look at? Those are all real time right now. So we can look at any district that's hiring and you can apply right there. Now let's say that we're still in high school and we're trying to figure out what college major do I want to pick? Because what are the most dangerous words in a college application that we never want to talk about? Starts with undeclared, and what's the next word? <laughs> undeclared major. We can talk numbers about what does this look like long term. I want to make sure that we're informing students on the front end. Hey, these are great programs you can become enrolled in that are producing results that are hireable. Because I know that every parent that can listen to me today loves their kids. I can promise you that all of our parents want their kids to get a job at the end of whatever program they decide to go through. So I want to start helping to steer students toward college majors that are getting hires. So that is one set of tools, and we can play this game for any kind of job that you want to talk about. I know I can see a question coming. A thousand. Thanks. Good. It, it, uh, uh, microphone. Sorry. Are you also, in this important bridge of education to, to employment, are you involved in, you said certificate, but micro-credentials are a big thing right now that help employers across the board yes, uh, value an individual. Are you involved in that too? Yes, yes ma'am. At both our, so we have Northwest Arkansas Technical Institute in Springdale. We have NWAC just up the road in Bentonville. We have business and industry training on the north side of Springdale, and I get to work with all those folks to help at least inform and educate the process and hopefully introduce students to them. So yes, ma'am, I'm, I'm a big supporter of credentials and micro-credentials. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, we can play that game with any job that our students want to plug into the computer, but then this provides another resource, if I can get back to it. Let's talk about this one for a minute. You remember building that first resume? That's a tough conversation because you don't have a lot of experience to market already. So just a quick analogy, how many of you do your own taxes? And looking at the hands that I see, how many of us are certified CPAs? 
<laughs> yummy, yummy. My guess is you use TurboTax or something like that, right? Some kind of online platform to help walk you through it. The reason that those programs are so popular, they take a very complicated process and make it real simple. And they, give you a, yeah, and they give you a finished product that you can stand on, right? This program will help students build that first resume. We've worked with a company named Tallow. I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but they're a, they live in the corporate world as a recruiting tool. <coughs> they can help students build those resumes. And if you've been in a vehicle in the last two years, you've undoubtedly heard ads for a zip recruiter or something like that. It takes on the form of making that introduction of these students to our prospective employers. It crosswalks all those 10,000 jobs and says, hey, Joe just came out of this program, has these <coughs> credentials, has these career interests. They seem to match with what you have. Would you like to start a conversation with Joe? And that, then it turns into almost a LinkedIn kind of page where it's direct communication between students and employers. So part of the battle is introducing students to the opportunities that are around them. As I sit here and watch from my new position, I'm watching our talent go elsewhere chasing jobs. And then a couple of years later, I watch them boomerang back as young families coming back to Arkansas. What could we have done with that couple of years that they were gone? So I'd love to try and retain our talent here in the state. But there are other resources that are in development now. We're working with the university to build a curriculum for teachers almost a daily micro-learning platform. If anybody here gets the daily motivational emails to your inbox, that kind of learning model where it's a two or three minute clip to start your day about effective career coaching, guiding, mentoring, next steps, and how to integrate that into daily lesson plans. We hope to have that ready to launch prior to spring break. It's in development now. And it's being done with employers, with HR professionals, so that we can walk students all the way to graduation day, and then that handoff between schools and employers is much more seamless. If we do our best to walk students to graduation day, and our graduation practices don't align with onboarding practice, we're still walking them right up to the finish line and dropping them off. I want to make sure that we're walking them right into the arms of our, of our employers and, and our colleges. There's a link here for employers to self-indicate this is the level that we'd like to help. We'd like to be a part of advisory councils, speaking panels, apprenticeship hosting. That way they're not getting calls from every school district across the state asking the same question. They can say, we'd like to help in this area. So if you need help, please reach out to us and there's a way for us to celebrate those partners on this site. The more students that I met with, the more common the question came back, well, what, what can I do for mom and dad? They're looking for jobs also. This site works for mom and dad, for aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters. There's an events and training link there for an adult audience. The more adults I met with, they needed coaching, mentoring, networking events, career fairs, young entrepreneurs needing a network of people. What we're trying to do now is take what was originally created to be a student tool and make it a universal tool because if you can break down those strands of communication, in my opinion, a large part of the battle is already won. If you've got mom and dad going to the same place as students, they're getting the same information that students got at school. So, careersnwa.com. It's live, it's free. Take a look. We're going to continue to work and develop that so that it could be a resource for everybody. But that, that's in the works now. And I'm not going to live in the PowerPoint too long, but just some things that I want to make sure that I leave you with. We know that we're growing in terms of diversity, and I think it's a great thing. There's a lot of strength in it. While we have students still in the K-12 system, employers are telling me that's a several dollar an hour immediate raise if we can use the words bilingual on resumes, and that's not just limited to written or spoken language. They're now including certain programming and coding languages as being bilingual. So we need to learn how to market the skills that we have. Awareness is very broad. And as I watch students leave, they're not paying attention to cost of living kind of factors whenever they consider where they're going. Can our students chase high paying jobs across the map? Absolutely they can. But if you're considering cost of living, Joe's opinion, you get much more for your dollar here in Arkansas than you do in several of the places that our students are going. 
and that's a lesson that we need to make sure they're hearing. The awareness piece, Northwest Arkansas, our students know who the big three are. They can rattle those off. They have a little more trouble when it talks about the other three and a half thousand employers it takes to make those larger machines work. Creating venues for them to take field trips and we're working now on a lot of virtual field trip programming, video production field trips. They need to see it, feel it, touch it, be a part of it. There's an event, and I hate to talk about what we couldn't do because of weather, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. We've all been a part of career fairs. It's a nice start. It's a way to get employers into our schools, a way to engage them. How can we ever ask our students to start making career decisions until they've done the work, until they've touched it, felt it, been a part of it, been shoulder to shoulder with our employers? I hate that rain got me. We're going to reschedule for early spring, and I want to invite you to be there. We were putting together a career expo, all job skills, all activity driven, standing shoulder to shoulder with our employers doing the work, the cybersecurity, the construction, the framing, the electrical, the plumbing, the concrete finishing, the truck driving simulators, the equipment. At the time that we had to call off because of rain, we had just shy 90 employers set up with large booths that were all interactive, very, very similar in scope to I know that my friend is back there very similar in scope to what you started with the Be Pro, Be Proud touring facility, and they were actually going to be there. They were part of the program. Now, have that facility or that traveling unit, plus about 89 more, creating hands on, tactile experiences for kids to start basing these career choices on. I don't want to see our kids make college career decisions based largely on theory without practice. So it, I am, once we reschedule, I'll send the invite. I'd love to have you there. Whenever we talk about the awareness piece, and I've got about two slides left, and then I'm going to step away. Our kids need to understand where they live. That's a population density map of wealth. Whenever we start talking about economies to live in, most folks wouldn't think good old Arkansas, right there in the hunt for several of these large paying jobs. So the lesson that we need to be talking about, don't let surface level understanding of these jobs make those career decisions for you. Let's dig deeper. If you want to go into healthcare, understand that only about a third of the employees in a hospital actually deal directly with patients. If you want to work for a retailer, understand it's a lot more than what you see in the store. If you want to work in finance, understand it's a lot more than what you see at the teller drive through window. So really trying to educate the process about the depth and candidly the pay of a lot of these jobs. I'm going to roll down to something. That one's hard to see, but let's talk about this one. We talk about engineering and STEM related fields a lot. We don't always get into the depth of the number of positions that we have available. Because when it comes to engineering, our problem isn't skills gap, it's retention. Same conversation applies to science positions. Think about how many layers of science it took from the time that you woke up this morning to where you're sitting right now to either get coffee or breakfast or to get here. To keep the lights on overhead. Science positions, they don't always have the best reputation with our students because they have the perception of the white coat and the glasses. But how many roles did it take to make life happen today? We all know that healthcare is a big one. In Northwest Arkansas, we can't get enough of any of our healthcare related positions. And that's whether it's dealing with patients or folks behind the scenes who make it all happen. One of the big areas that I'm working with our employers, especially for this learn and earn kind of model, because I'm one of those, I think we should graduate high school. I think we should take a strong look at all of these 10,000 openings that we have. If there are entry level positions there, let's build some experience. Let's build the understanding of what I do want to do, or probably more importantly, what I don't want to do. And then in the last year, those almost 1,000 employers I've met with, I haven't met one yet that doesn't have some kind of continuing education <coughs> benefit in their program. Healthcare is a big one. Had a meeting with Northwest just a couple of weeks ago, and if I misspeak, I apologize. But I believe their numbers for supporting even their entry-level nursing students to continue to go to school, I believe is somewhere in the neighborhood of about 5,000 a year, continuing education support. I can have this same conversation with just about any employer and they'll say for the right people, we'll train them all day long. Our kids need to understand that. 
So it's not an either or, it's an and. Computer science is going to continue to grow through the roof across the state between now and 2030. I spend a lot of time talking with students about the multiple on and off ramps. They get to see this information and then we talk a lot about this one. This was a survey of about 400 of our regional employers. This is the second time this survey has been done. I can't say that it changed much from the first time to this one. Those are the skills that they're lacking that they need the most of. And it doesn't really matter what they're paying. Kind of speaks to the point that bring us great people who are willing to work and we'll help train them. So I think instead of digging deeper into that, I'm just gonna stop there. Not, let's, let's have, if you have questions, I'd love to talk about those. If you'd like to explore that careers tool, I invite you to do that. You busy next week? You wanna come to Elbrow? I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll come on, just wherever you need me, I'll come on. Yeah. Because I, I think this is too important for our kids not to hear. It's, it's I like it. yeah. Any other questions? Just a comment, I think, going uh, along with it. Mr. Williamson said, this is needed not just for Northwest Arkansas, this is needed in the Delta, this is needed in the Southwest, this is needed in Central. Uh, you know, I don't know what we need to do or who needs to take the ball and run with it, but uh, I think that, that um, this is something that every child, every person in Arkansas needs access that access to that is built for their area of the state. And so I don't know how we make that happen or who needs to get involved, but it's it's uh, it's something that that uh, I'm very thankful that y'all stepped forward and saw the need and 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 got us going on it. Well, I I agree with you wholeheartedly, and I'll tell you the steps are already being taken to add one more layer to that website where you can see a picture of the state and click on which region you live in and play the same game. It may take a minute for development. It took me a, it took us a year to get to this point. I'm sure, yeah. But I, I think the bulk of the work has been done and it's just one additional layer to add. What was the genesis of this? Where did it come from? So the, the data engine comes from, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a data intelligence company called Chimura. Now after, after we got that data engine, we started to build the student friendly user interface around it and that was kind of the work that we did. So there are several partner organizations responsible for what you saw today. But did the Economic Council, who, who was in lead so they, on this? They're working with us, now, uh, the, uh, the Northwest Arkansas Council was lead on this and then we, as we've introduced it to more and more groups, we have partnerships with our chambers, with the Economic Development Commission, uh, with Department of Workforce Services, they, they all see the value and want to partner with us in it. So that's, the that's at least one vehicle for sharing it across the state. Yeah. Would this be something that next summer in our um, summer conference that we have for educators, this would be a great presentation, I think, for that conference. Um, Gina's been texting me all these notes about <laughs> all these connections, so yes. I, I, I hope that I can help with any of that because it, it's a privilege to be here. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I mean, thank I have you. A question okay. to, as, as it relates to a little beyond the scope of this board, but not beyond my, uh, well, the scope know. that I we have sort now. Of do everything now. Uh, well, just from the standpoint of higher education, you know. So you have you have NWAC, you have you know the the flagship up there. You have uh, Northwest Technical Institute. What's their interaction and role? How do they fit into this? The partnerships or the things that are going on here. So I. I get to tell people that I get to wake up smiling and go to work every day because I, I get to work in all of those areas. NWAC, NTI, the university. Uh, we have, there's another business and industry tech training program in Springdale. They've all seen this. They all want to use it. Uh, our 16 public school districts have all adopted this as a career training resource. I know that NWAC has pushed this out across their network to be a career training resource as has NTI. In my opinion, if we can get everyone using the same tool, it becomes that much more powerful to everybody. So I, publicly, I want to praise them for being a part of it, but I'm excited to see our students start using this as a, uh, as a career database. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. We Thank appreciate you. you making the drive down. Yeah, it was well worth it for, for us, me. for sure. Yes, if, I can, if I can be a resource going forward, I'd love to. Absolutely. Next time, I, I just don't want to follow our <clears throat> teacher of the year. I'm not sure I can uh, quite keep up, but uh, thank you.
thank you very much. And that leads nicely into our next report because regardless of the skills that a student needs, we know they'll need to know how to read. So uh, we have uh, Jenny Riley with us. And y'all have heard me mention this before. Uh, she is the professional who's working at Hall High School when the ninth and 10th graders, they're on a block schedule there. So uh, she uh, gets to work with the, the students and teaching the teachers about how to uh, reach high school students and um, you, you don't teach them the same way you would a kindergarten child, but you do. And uh, she's having good success at Hall and I am hopeful that uh, the other high schools, not only in uh, the Little Rock School District, but across the state will see this, see the value in it. She's with a group called the 95% group, which is sort of based on, they can all learn to read, basically. So with that, I'll get, give you Jenny Riley. Thank you, Madam Chairman, Secretary of Education and Board. Thank you for allowing me to come today and share the things that are going on. Um, the high hopes for literacy at Hall I work with four of the best uh, English teachers around, and uh, I can't say enough of good things that they're doing with those kids. What I want to give you today is a little bit of background of how I got here and what we're doing, and um, then let you see the kids actually working. and when we get to the video part, I want you to notice the engagement. Yes, the teacher's up there doing some teaching, but I want you to look at the faces of the students and what they're doing because I'm amazed at the um, engagement that we have daily with these kids. It, not I, I, I'm elementary education, special ed, so I kind of thought, Oh, I can do this because I believe you can teach any child to read. But when I stepped into that ninth and tenth grade class and realized I had to teach the same skills or I had to help the teachers teach the same skills that we taught in kindergarten, first grade, and second, I thought, oh, they're going to eat me. Not one time. Not one time disrespectful. Not one time this is baby. At the end of class, they always say, I got a question for you. What about this word? And, and so the engagement and the kids actually wanting to learn to read helps. But if I can work technology, which I'm not real good. Dan, can you help me? You can, yeah, can, there's a switch. Maybe out on the side. Let so me get the glasses the off. Show me how to do this. OK. The, we need to look at the profile. There's three profiles we need to look, and the first is the school population, and um, th those are the numbers. I don't need to read those numbers to you because you've seen that, but I want you to look. What really gets me is when we look at the English language learners, the high percentage, the low income, and the special ed. That's the population that we're working with in ninth and tenth grade. Um, these students come to us like this. Hall did not create these kids. It's not that they've been in our district and under our care all this time. They come to us. And as we used to tell kindergarten, you get what you get and you don't throw a fit. And that's the attitude these teachers have is they come to us, we can change it. And, and so that's just the start of where what we look at is our, our profile of our kids. Then we have to look at our actual scores and when we look at the, profi the reading profici proficiency we have 75 that did not meet expectations 75 percent of our kids but we also have 14 that are approaching but that 14 didn't meet expectation either so we have 89 percent of the children that we have in our building are not ready reading ready at grade level Again, you get what you get, and you don't throw a fit. So several years ago, the school, I mean, the state came back with three tiers. And what we decided is we had to look at 
tier one, when you have as low 89%, you have to start with tier one, which is your main curriculum. You've got to do something. Well, Hall has entered, we have 95% group, and with that, we're using interactive learning. Um, that those are games that, that kids are using to practice the, the skills that we're teaching. Uh, our English teachers have been through RISE or are currently going through RISE. And when I meet with them, I hear, you know, this makes sense what we're doing in RISE now. I, I understand. Um, and then they also, the kids use Alexia Power Up to practice. That's what we've done the first semester. Now that we're in to, uh, going into the second semester, we're looking at tier two intervention. And it's gonna be in targeting specific kids. And what we did is we used a program called Smart Data that looks at attendance, it looks at grades, and it looks at behavior, and it ranks children. And from that, we looked at that group of students that needed the help. That, and then we sat down with teachers and we talked about this child and that child. So from that, we have a group of targeted children now that we're getting, look, getting ready to start the small group intervention. And then of course, always we have on the tier three, which is one-on-one -on -one intervention and special ed. Uh, another program that's being taught in some of the critical reading classes is Wilson. So it's all lined out there. And it looks really, really good until you look at this factor right here that has not, and it's the third profile, which is the teacher profile. Again, I say Hall has some of the most wonderful English teachers there could ever be. However, they have never been taught how to read, teach to read those foundational reading skills, and that's what these children do not have. It's not been part of their secondary education. So as the students have been learning, the teachers have been learning. Um, I s had a science teacher sat in one day while we were doing and we were talking and doing all this and she come at, up afterwards and said, I'm gonna become an English teacher if you'll be in here with me. I've never heard this stuff before. And I said, well, it, it, it's there, it's good. Um, and if this is Scarbo's rope and I'm sure somebody else has presented it, but if you'll look down at word recognition, those are those early learning skills. The upper part is the language comprehension. And what we found is our kids don't have that word reading. Our teachers did, did not know how to teach it. So when we put all of these skills together, we come, uh, all of these profiles together, we came up with this program, um, the 95% group. Now, I am not, part, I am, I'm not an employee of 95% group, but I am, um, I work closely with them. And this is what we've come out, of using that program. These are students. These are ninth and 10th grade students. These are the amazing things that are happening. They're pulled, they're, they sit in front of the class. It's not like they're at a desk and nobody can see what they're doing. They're in front of the class teaching. The second picture is a picture of note taking and, and, and they're engaged, they love it. These children, to me, they're on fire and I'm thinking, how have we missed this population? Um, down at the bottom, again, this is a student that's presenting to the, the class um, and the kids are, they're, they're astonished. They're, they're writing, they're taking, they're pulling. And, uh, things that you would think this is where your behavior problems would come. That's one of the first things that we've noticed in class behavior has declined. These kids are engaged. They're doing something. Um, and the last little picture is just where they have used that Lexia power up where they started is the light blue and then it's a little bit darker and then the top and, and those that's progress. That's progress for those kids. But I want to show you a brief little um, DVD or, or video. And in this, the students are using complex text to find the words that we've taught the pattern for, and I, I can't do it without using my hands. You have 
closed syllable and a vowel silent E. Those are the things that you're going to see that. They're doing this, so they're not doing anything they shouldn't. Um, they're finding those words in a, the complex text that they've had in class. Uh, they highlight them. They go through a gallery walk. They discuss it with the teacher. Um, they talk about the types of syllables, and, and I don't know that y'all know this. Did you know? Some of you may, Miss Luckadoo. Uh, there are only seven types of syllables. And if, once you teach those seven types of syllables, it makes up all the world, the words in the world. And knowing that has inspired these kids. And you'll see how some of them are at one level with single or uh, one syllable words, but then you'll see how they quickly take it over to be multi syllable words. So if I can go over, yeah, there you go. Start this little DVD. Um, I did bring. Jamie Hatfield with me today. She is one of the 10th grade English teachers that I have. And if you have questions for me or uh, Jamie, as far as being a classroom teacher, um, I'll be glad, we'll be glad to try to answer them after this little clip we have. Hey guys, so today here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna use our complex text, which today is the monkey's paw. We've read it before, but this time we're gonna go on a word hunt. For closed syllable words, okay, and for vowel long e words. You got it? It's not just for a paragraph, but as far as you can go, and you can divide it however you want to in your team. And you know we're double divided today. So I have my two greens over here, my two pinks here, my two blues here. So divide it how you want to, but work together. And you're going to create, you're going to highlight your list on your paper. When the timer ends, and it's going to be fast, you're going to come get your poster, because we're going to do a gallery walk today. Cool. So, get that set up. We're going to start with 30 seconds. Ready? Are we ready? Let's go. Do you need to move to see what they're doing? Oh, she can help each other? Sorry, Jamie. Fire me. 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 Kinda. I think we get them. Yeah, but I, I don't know if I do this as fast. Uh, like, yeah, they get them. They give me the word violence, right? But like, yeah, they or like they come to the back and I did it real fast. Right. I'm like, okay. Okay. All right. Like, you didn't know you could? I know, because I surprised myself. I was like, I did that fast. And they were like, yeah, you did. I was like, they found one in another group. I'm going to have you write it down. Mm -hmm. And I want to see what you do with it. Mm -hmm. Sudden. S U D D E N. Mm -hmm. No, I'm here. In your pink. Mm -hmm. You'll help her out. Talk her through it. Vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel, consonant. You and it immediately look at the pattern, but look at me. What do you do? If it's got more than one syllable, more than syllables, what should you do? It's okay. So focus on the syllables first. There you go. Oh, oh, oh look at that division. That's close. The sounds are we've got sud, dis, sud, din. So put it together. To go around and look at other people's words and see what they did differently. For example, we just added sudden right here. This would be my model, okay? They broke it down. Sudden has how many sounds? Two. Two. So it's a multi syllable. Oh my gosh, all the air hot fives right now. Multi syllable word. So the first thing to do was to sound it out. Sudden. Okay. Find out where the division is. Then they found the pattern type in both of the words. Sud. Den. Or what type? Closed. Oh, we all say closed. Closed. Okay. 
They're all closed. But that was actually really, really good. They have that down. When they can start identifying it like this and explaining it, you are on fire. So what I want you to do is look at other teams' posters, add on to your article, highlight one that you maybe didn't get, make note of ones you find interesting. If you want to make a note here, let me see your market. Okay? You want to make a note right here, like with a, oh, a smiley face, just to let them know good job. That always helps, right? That always helps. Okay, I'm going to give y'all about, what, three minutes? You need four? All right, three and a half. Let's put the middle. Thank you. Welcome. All right, guys. So, good job on the yoga walk. Did y'all like doing that? Did it make you kind of realize that we're all in the same boat? Yeah. Some have a little bit more knowledge. Some have a little less. But it's really evenly distributed, and I like that. So, y'all are doing a good job being a team. I need, speaking of teams, each team to give me one word under each syllable type that we look for today. So what were those syllable types again? Thank you. I'd like to see those hand gestures one more time. Very good. To me, that's a total physical response, which helps you memorize. All right, here we go. Blue one, I need to close. And the final end. Oh, wet. 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 And what is that? Wet is closed and game is vowel silent E. Game is vowel silent E. Tricky, tricky. Pink one. Small for closed. Small for closed. And white for vowel silent E. White for vowel silent E. I would like for Stephanie. To come teach us lessons. Don't forget to ask for the hand gestures. Okay. The best part. I'm going to sit in your seat while you teach. So excited. Okay, so first things first. How many syllables we got? Two. 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 So what do we do? What do we do, y'all? Seven months. Oh. Oh. That was really off the beat. Let's do it again. Ready? Toes. Toes. There we go. What's the first one? No? Don't answer that. So, first one we got is stuck, right? <laughs> what are the sounds? Uh, 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 uh. Hey, y'all, go. Consonant. And the vowel. Consonant. The vowel sound is sort of long. Short. 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 So is it closed or not? Close. close. What's the hand symbol for close? There y'all go. <laughs> What's our second uh, uh, syllable? Oh. 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 Yeah. Starts with a vowel. Long. 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 We said long. What's the hand signal for long? Do we? Y'all so smart. Oh can my God. Can I fix one little bitty thing? When you're starting off, you always look to your vowel, right? You find your vowel type. Yes. And although we don't pronounce that E, it goes here. So if I'm looking at the vowel first, mm -hmm. that's the pattern type. So when you were asking long or short, a lot of people were just looking at this CVE or CVC that looks a lot or exactly like that. Great job, though. I know that was long and I'm sorry, but no, you had to get it all in there. Um, that's the enthusiasm that we teach with. These children are so eager to learn this. And one thing that I forgot to tell you is there are no programs out there for high school kids, for secondary, in this. Um, now, the 95% group that we're using, it, they've used it through eighth grade, but they haven't used it past that. So we really are stepping off into total new territory, and they are helping us tremendously. But this is exciting for me because I have kids come up and say, 
I used that. I, I used that rule the other day, and I could sound out that word because they know how to, to use it. Chunk it is what we call it in elementary. Uh, but they know how to do that. And so I know we're giving them skills, and I know that there's going to be progress made. So. I think the thing that, uh, from a teacher's point of view, the fact that you're using the visual, auditory, and tactile, and you never know which child learns which way, Absolutely. and if you're working in a group, you almost have to, but the, the syllables and all that. But thank you for being here, and thank you for being receptive, uh, because that your receptiveness is 95% of what can happen for your students. And uh, uh, it was not a judgment at all because you're an English teacher and you're in high school and kids are supposed to know how to read before they got there, right? And uh, so I'm sure that hopefully this is helpful to you because you see the students. You wanna come up? You're a teacher, of course you well, wanna come up. And, and you have to understand, <laughs> it's been holding hands. It's just like holding that first year teacher's hand to help them because it's uncharted territory. And, and they don't want to do it wrong. I, I just don't want to do it wrong. You're not going to do it wrong. I promise you, you're not. But go ahead, Jamie. Um, the most exhilarating thing about this process at Hall High School is that for the 12 years I've been there, most of our students come on a third to fifth grade reading level. And that was when I taught ninth grade and 10th grade and we would kind of hit this brick wall over and over again and we would have kids that we could modify and do auditory listening and we could do projects and we could do testing more in a discussion format. And the kids were brilliant, they could critically think. And so we're like, okay, this year, standardized test and they weren't achieving. And this was the um, 95, Dr. Roberts believed in us and brought in 95% group this was the first year that we've really seen a change and been given those tools. And so now we have kids that are more comfortable reading out loud, digging into deeper text. And this whole group approach has given them confidence and comfort to say, hey, I don't know for sure how to pronounce this. And so we stop and we sound out the word, we, you know, we sound out the sounds in the word, we do the syllables. And yes, when I went to school for, uh, <laughs> A literature degree this was not what I anticipated doing but what it's giving children is the love of reading and whatever y'all do decide to do for Hall High School I hope you continue to invest in programs and educators that want what's best for our kids and all the kids that come through not ones that fit pretty little packages uh, well said uh, and Jeannie if you will uh, tell us how you came from Mountain Home, Arkansas, retired by way of McGee, Arkansas, <laughs> and wound up in being able to bring this program to Hall. Uh, well, I started my education in McGee and taught for 20 years and moved to Mountain Home. And um, at that time, I became involved in dyslexia, in the education part of learning, teaching myself and others. Um, so for the past 14 years or so, I've worked with dyslexia, uh, educating myself and others, and helping students. And I truly do believe all kids can learn to read. I don't believe I taught all kids, but they can. Um, and so I, I thought, you know, it's time for me to go to the house. I'm mm, 36 this time, yeah. So I decided I'd retire, and I thought I'd go crazy. Because teaching reading, or teaching a child to read changes their life opportunities as a wise man told me one time. Um, and when I read about school districts that are struggling and kids that are struggling and they're not getting it, I, I can't sit back and not do anything. And so um, somebody approached me about a possibility of a job and I was like, in Little Rock? I don't know, you know, that's a longer, and then I thought, what the heck? These babies need to learn to read. And so it's my passion that, I help teachers understand that they can do this and give them the tools and the confidence that they need to be successful so they can teach the children what they need to know. They're still children. And I loved hearing what the man said about the job opportunities because if they can't read and we don't get in there, those job opportunities are not gonna be there for those kids and that hurts my heart. 
that and the fact that if they can't read, their children aren't going to read because they're not going to read to them. So we have to make a difference. And I applaud Dr. Roberts because not only did he choose a program, he did something that I have never seen an administrator do is he hired somebody that he calls an expert. I don't know about that, but he hired somebody to stand there with the child, with the with teachers as they're teaching those children. That's very uncommon, but that is so what's needed for these high school teachers to be able to be successful in teaching because it's out of their their comfort zone. It's out of their knowledge field. It would be I told somebody it'd be like putting me in a chemistry class. I wouldn't know what to do. But if I had somebody to hold my hand, that I would try it, and then when they let my hand go, I would stand there, but if I needed, I could reach back. And so that's the opportunity that he's provided these teachers, and that to me is the key to the success of this program, because the teachers have em embraced it, and they see a difference. Very good. Any other questions or comments? Okay, Dr. Moore? Yeah, so I've been in a lot of, high school classes recently and seen a lot of round robin reading. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are y'all working with teachers in other subject areas? I'm thinking history, science, and all that to, to, to highlight that. what you're working doing and how to allow them to have more effective practices. So I'm also practices. the 10th grade academy lead at Come Hull High School. Come over to the microphone. Sorry. I'm also one of the 10th grade academy leads at Hall High School. Um, and our social studies teachers are really excited and they're yeah. ready to get the initial training to understand what they're looking for and how they can help within their own content, including using vocabulary from their text with specific lessons. And um, the science teachers, it was interesting how they came to be. They're excited because this will help with their Greek and Latin root words that are absolutely necessary in the science fields and the upcoming medical fields. And Ms. Riley is being very humble because she's changing lives at our school of our students. Um, one of the science teachers came to me two days ago and said, hey, there's this student. I think based off what y'all are talking about, she may have some traits. And I said, I had her. I went and pulled up her old file and looked at a few things and I thought, Phew. because I didn't know then what I was looking at. Because no one taught me. No one in my college, no one in my district. It's not what high school teachers did. And I called Ms. Riley, she walked me through it. And I have to say, the child definitely um, has markers and she will go further in testing and I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to apologize for her to her and even though you know I didn't have the knowledge now I do and I had the opportunity to say you're not dumb because I know she felt that way she's expressed that several times you just need some extra help and because of this we'll be able to get her help that can follow her in college and so it really is some life-changing stuff and uh, very proud. Very thankful. One thing I forgot to tell you, that's a pre-AP English class that you just saw. Pre-AP. And the engagement of the students amazes me. I mean, it, it's every day. And I had heard the attendance was better and the behavior was better. So all of that leads into the other. Thank you both very much. Oh, uh, yeah. Mr. Oh, sir. I can't have Miss Riley up here without getting to say something. <laughs> yeah, so when she talked about the other people that she helped educate, uh, on these issues, uh, I was one of them because I was in the Senate, and uh, she brought a, a student, uh, one, uh, and who's now signed to play basketball, I think, or mm -hmm. I, I forget, or maybe that was her sister. That's anyway, her sister. Okay, twin, there's, there's they both, twins, yeah. and they're both. But anyway, they, uh, this young lady came to the Capitol, and I knew the family and everything else. I had no idea the challenge, though. That, and this was a family you would not, you know, they are just normal you know if they need something for their kids they're going to get it for their kids they just didn't know what to do and you know this it was an example of how uh, across the state there are so many families that don't know what to do to get the help for their kids and frankly I don't know that Mountain Home was doing everything it needed to do at the time Ms. Riley until you brought uh, some of these things to our uh, the attention of uh, uh, administration and, and the staff and uh, so that's what you know prompted me to work with uh, uh, and support Senator Elliott in 
the dyslexia, changing the dyslexia laws. Now, I know what we're talking about is far beyond just dyslexia, but mm -hmm. um, and Ms. Hatfield, uh, she reminded me uh, that I, a couple, few years ago, I called her homecoming queen. <laughs> what you need to know about her is after, I don't know how many years of 11, a, 11 year hiatus of a homecoming parade for Hall High School, she brought that back. And, and uh, though some of you weren't here, uh, I think it was Mr. Curris, uh, when Mr. Curris was there, and he bragged on that and what a great event that was because that was something that high school kids, you know, we talk about the trad traditional high school experience, that was something those kids didn't have. So uh, not only does she work to um, learn how to be a better teacher and engage, uh, she also uh, helped to bring about uh, culture and, and improve the culture at the school. So while she's here, I want to embarrass her and tell her. No, it doesn't embarrass job. me. Okay, good, good. May All I right, put good. that on my resume. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody uh, else? Ms. Chambers? I just want to thank you. Um, given such a broad need, this is not limited to one school. And to uh, the Secretary's point, this is not just dyslexia, obviously, this is broader. Are there opportunities, and this may not be a question for you, maybe it's for the department, but it seems like this could be applied, needs to be applied in so many other places. Are, we, wor are we working on that? We're hoping exposure like this yeah. will probably I, I would ask Stacy to, to, to come and, and talk <laughs> about that. So. Good morning, Stacy Smith. So, um, yes, um, we, are in the op we are in the process right now of reviewing um, programs, literacy programs that was required by legislation the last session. Um, we opened up for a vendor call for K2 recently and so we um, have 50 that made it through phase one that we are digging in deep to make sure that they meet the science of reading. Um, the second call will be for 3-6 and the third call will be for intervention programs, secondary programs, and dyslexia programs. I would fully expect the 95% group to submit in that. So as a department, we will be actually putting out a list of programs that are aligned to the science of reading. Um, and with that, we'll be putting the professional development and support that those programs offer. And so, um, you know, they mentioned that there are fewer secondary programs or fewer programs that are aimed at high school kids. Um, that's, a, that's a true statement. So I think that list will be fairly lean. Um, but the law does require that the department put out the list and then it requires that districts um, in purchasing programs in the future, the program has to be on that list or they have to submit to the department rationale of purchasing something else. So we, we are doing that, but we're going through a, um, a, a pretty strict process um, in our review. And I okay. think that teachers like you, because we're always talking about teacher voice and student voice, I mean, I would think those of you who have experienced would be great to, you know, give testimony, give whatever to those districts as, as they go along, because you've, you've seen it work, you've helped it work. And when we know better, we do better. I know that's a th saying that it may be overused, but I think... That is absolutely, there is, in, in my experience in all these years, I have never come in contact with an educator who didn't grow once they knew what it was they needed to know next. So I appreciate that attitude, but it's pretty much the attitude of teachers across the board. And, I, and I'll, I'll follow up that. We did a survey not long ago of curriculum directors around the state about their needs as curriculum directors to support their schools. And in the top three, secondary literacy was there. Um, at, the, at the department level in my group, um, secondary liter literacy was not our first focus for our literacy piece. It was always in the plan, but it's, it was that second step, and we're just now breaking into that. We did put very specific goals pertaining to secondary literacy within the $38 million grant, and so hopefully that will be a piece that will help propel implementation. Just the last thing I'll say about the video, I'm glad you brought that because when I watch, was watching that video, it reminded me of what Dr. Pfeffer and I saw when we went to uh, Scranton uh, Elementary several years ago now, which was really part of the, uh, you know, one of the things that drove us to uh, in create the RISE initiative, uh, because we saw the science of reading being used at the elementary level. But it was, you know, the, those elementary kids were able to tell you the rules of the English language. And these were things that I had not heard for heard before, and there were 
third and fourth graders talking about Latin roots and, you know, like, you know, you don't expect that. But because they knew it and because it, they, they were, I mean, they were just engaged at a level that I hadn't seen. And so, I, you know, I saw the same thing with those kids. So it was, uh, I'm, I'm glad it may have, it wasn't too long at all. So we'd have nothing but time in, on Fridays, <laughs> right? So um, it, it, was, it was good. And then the, uh, the other thing that I just remind you all that there are policy issues that when it comes to literacy, we have created these artificial mm -hmm. barriers. And one of those was uh, some of those courses that we would have called a few years ago remedial courses. Uh, strategic reading, critical reading, some of those things that, you know, with your help, they, students can now get credit for those. In the past, as a remedial course, they could not get credit. Now they can get credit uh, as a, a, an elective, but, uh, you know, here comes Stacy again. I know. <laughs> but, but there's so much to this. That's why I just want to bring it up. There's so much to this uh, uh, cracking this this literacy uh, problem that we have as a society. And, and some of these things are, are knowledge, some of these things are preparation, but some of these things are policy, they're just bad policies that we have the responsibility to fix when we find, when we see the opportunity. You stop talking, I'd share some more Sorry, information. <laughs> yes. Um, so one exci exciting thing about the critical reading and strategic reading pieces is we just worked with Lysinger and we opened that up because we recognize that the K-6 elementary teachers and literacy specialists are the ones who are getting the most training right now. Um, and so we've opened that up to allow those teachers in high schools who want to put those teachers in those classrooms to meet some of those remedial needs and it actually still count for credit. Before, we were very restricted by your license and your requirement and your grade bands and who could teach what. So we've tried to be a little bit more flexible. So I appreciate teacher effectiveness opening that up. So that's an exciting piece. Right. Thank you all very much. There's yeah. also oh, okay, sure. an invitation I actually gave to Commissioner Key earlier. I have an open door policy. It's okay. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. all right. Come on. Um, <laughs> I have an open door policy in my classroom. So you might not ever know what you see. I'm rather goofy in my class, but you are always welcome to come and if Dr. Roberts or Ms. Riley can facilitate that for you anytime. Okay. Thank you very much. You. Uh, I think the uh, because of the work of the 95% group and those involved actively in, in the dyslexia and the, the brain science, the exciting thing for me is the brain <laughs> science has now demonstrated it absolutely does not matter if you're in poverty are in uh, of a dip, of, it, regardless of the race, regardless of the ethnicity, regardless of your parents, the brain science has just demonstrated that you can learn to read. That is not a absolutely. Yeah, that is that it, it's no longer a theory. <laughs> it's an absolute. So we have to shift our brains and, and understand that and quit using. Well, they can't because they can't because because they can because. Thank you all very much. Okay, and other reports from uh, members? Anything in particular? Uh, Ms. Newton? Uh, we had our, our ESSA meeting yesterday and uh, got yes. a great update from the department on the things that are going on. Uh, uh, Ms. Kaufman reminded us that this is the four-year-old anniversary of ESSA. Doesn't seem like it's been that long, but uh, uh, it, it's four years old. And uh, she uh, updated us on the different things the department is go doing. And one of the things I was most impressed with is, is this. We've talked about it over and over and over. This is not a static document. That they're constantly looking at ways to improve what they're doing. One of the things that they're working on is trying to. Uh, work on getting more information out to the public. They've got several things under development there. So if you would go to the department's website and, and under ESSA go to the informational documents page, you will find lots of new information there. Uh, the school reports are going to be released in January. Um, Which is three months earlier. Yes, instead of April 15th. She said that not all 17 models will be complete, but about 95% of the data will be available then, so they're going to go ahead and release what they have at that point, and then the rest will be released in April as it comes available. Um, uh, one thing under assessment, uh, the ACT Aspire is going to be field testing, uh, I think in February, a, 
a new riding uh, summative. Uh, it's going to eventually give the, the uh, children a choice of two text-dependent um, evidence-based writing prompts instead of just one um, general writing prompt, like maybe one sentence uh, type thing. So that's, a, that's progress, I think, for, for the students. I think the field test is going to be paper-based, but eventually you know, it would go back to the computer. Uh, one thing I was very excited about is they're putting together a PLC group for principals to um, be, at or be able to better use data to drive instruction. Uh, you know, we were getting PLCs for teachers and working real hard at that. This is going to be a PLC for, for principals uh, statewide, and, and the way they're going to handle it is they're going to do a series of videos, and then on a specific day they'll come together um, via Zoom or, or some online platform to have a question and answer and sharing session. So uh, that was very exciting. And then we had a, a report from a new unit in the department uh, called the District Support Unit. And what it was doing was assisting districts that are have been in level three that are now moving into level four with uh, different uh, areas of support and progress. And, and, and I think the main thing that was emphasized is that each district and each school is different and they require different kinds of and levels of support and they're working hard to make sure they get what they need. And then we had a report on the Perkins um, uh, plan that's, uh, that's being submitted for approval. And uh, one of the things I think I was most impressed with is the amount of alignment between it and the co cooperation between it and our, as a plan and what we're doing here at the department. So I think that's going to be a great thing uh, for us. And then um, uh, Ms. Kaufman talked to us a little bit about the amendment process that they're getting uh, some um, input on now in the spring uh, of this year, thinking about what can we do different on our ESSA plan and um, looking at um, accountability, uh, maybe thinking about adding a fourth group of accountability so that we would be able to um, have more high schools that are in that lower particular areas of um, performance to be able to get the support that they need and I think they're going to do a um, getting more feedback until April and then kind of go back and look at what's what has been suggested and if you have suggestions even on um, I don't know if you remember but we had a, a group A uh, of uh, uh, indicators but then we also had a group B and C of indicators that we might use at the future so if you kind of got some ideas of things that we might use it in indicators for for performance I think between the sooner you can get those in the better so if you've had I had some ideas stewing in your mind you might want to get those into Ms. Kaufman's group but uh, uh, I think between now and April they're going to be doing some thinking about what where we want to go from here and, and what direction we want to take as far as improving our plan. Uh, we're going to meet again in February, so if you're interested, be, you're welcome to come. I think it's February 26th. And they do live stream those. Yes, so it is live stream. I usually watch at yes. home. And if you want to go back and, and, and watch the video, there was some great information. I'm not very good at summarizing what we did in about four hours. So, um, Another thing that I, I wanted to bring up, we had our GAC call this week. Uh, Governor Affairs through NASB and um, uh, just it was just kind of a close out of the year and thinking about the future and uh, I think that our main point of discussion was what direction do the, do they want us to do we want them to kind of look at going forth in the future for the upcoming year and I mentioned literacy and the career ed focus uh, as far as for Arkansas some other things that were mentioned were um, uh, teacher recruitment and retention. So I think those will be the focus of, of at the national level for our group. And then uh, I think uh, commissioner's gonna talk about this, but uh, I was privileged to go to South Pike County and celebrate with them being selected as one of the Apple Distinguished Schools. Uh, there were two in the state, both of them were at South Pike County, the high school and the elementary at Murfreesboro. So it was a great honor. I think only 470 worldwide and uh, it, it was uh, a great day. They, I think the, the thing that was most impressive at, at, at the um, school, we went from kindergarten all the way through seniors looking at how they were using technology. And it wasn't uh, that the technology was the 
end all be all this was the way that that you know this is going to solve all of our problems but this was something that they were putting into teachers hands and then putting into students hands as a, a tool to use to help drive instruction to use they were using data and 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 then you know using this to enhance and provide more students for um, more opportunities for students and then we got to meet two young men and i think you've got more on that that uh, actually won uh, a pretty pre prestigious award so i'm gonna let you take care of all okay. that all right. okay but uh, it was a great day and i'm very honored to be a part of that miss chambers <coughs> okay miss dean um just a couple of updates that the um, family and community engagement team is still going through the the plans that were submitted by the districts and they're continuing to have the monthly um, the monthly uh, family and community advisory meetings so, and we'll be meeting this afternoon after the meeting okay. immediately okay. thank you uh, Ms. McAdoo, anything more? Yes. <coughs> okay, so um, this is month five of my Teacher of the Year sojourn or, or what have you. And I can honestly say that being subjected to and a part of the board has, this has been probably the most traumatic um, days of my professional career. And I hope that moving forward, these next six and a half months of my tenure will not be as traumatic as, as this first part. Last month, Grassroots Arkansas came and invited us all to go on an equity tour with them. And I went with them. It was also traumatic <laughs> and emotionally draining. Not so much because of the, like, I had visited both of these schools before and in my travels, even as Teacher of the Year, I've gone to lots of different schools where I have seen just differences. And you can't compare structures that are like 60 something years difference in age and, and expect to see the same thing. But what was, what was heartbreaking, not just in, in that equity tour, but in a lot of the travels that I've, I've gone on is things that we don't really talk about, the things that we don't see, like the environmental health inequities, um, specifically at, in this equity tour that we went to, when we went to Cloverdale, we, we looked at, or I looked at, I listened to and talked to people about the air quality and the impact that it has on asthmatics there. And we all know the brain research on learning environments in terms of natural light and windows and brightness and all of that. So that, that as we move forward, I would hope that we also think a little bit more about the impact that the buildings themselves have on students, specifically even when we look at data on um, standardized testing and all of that stuff, because that, those things do impact students. So that was the traumatic part. The other part, um, since we last met, has been very exciting. I've had the, the honor of being a part of a lot of projects dealing with student voice, which is more than just allowing the students an opportunity to say what they think, it's actually putting into practice what they say and allowing students and teachers, because I've also been a part of like Teacher Institute and those things as well, allowing them an opportunity to help build up whatever you're talking about, the schools, the programs. And for me personally, that's really exciting as we move forward, we being the Little Rock School District, move forward with the community schools model because I think that a lot of the learning that I'm getting from the teacher leader institutes and student voice institutes can kind of help 
hopefully, if, if I'm given the opportunity to share these things with the district and, and the people that are making decisions about what that looks like, hopefully I'll be able to contribute and, ben and contribute to that conversation. And the last thing that I'm really, really excited about is I've also been working with AETEN, um, I guess for, at this point, what feels like about a year on my platform, which is using passion and poetry to close the opportunity gap. So I have developed a professional development course for Ideas Matters that um, using, well, we've changed the title, it's now called Go In Poet, but it's using poetry as a vehicle to allow student voice as it relates to learning and closing all of those opportunity gaps. In addition to the professional development course that I've developed for our Ideas Matter, I, they also did a docu-series where they followed me in the classroom and with my students for their, the, the last couple of months. And both projects are now officially complete and they are at the department awaiting final approval, so hopefully they get the go and um, they'll be able to be put on Ideas Matter where teachers can go in and, and see videos very similar to what we saw. Well, not similar to that because I'm not teaching how to decode words or how to read, but I am teaching teachers how to use reflective practice um, to question and draw out students knowledge of, of different content and how to empower students through their voice to advocate for whatever it is that they want to do or be in life. So those are the things that I have been doing for the last month since we met. Um, one of the other things that I'm really, really excited about is the whole piece around the Student Voice Institute and having the opportunity to work with and go in with um, the different colleges for the student interns and the teacher cadets, that has been really, really exciting. Probably because that, that's been the part where I've been able to connect with young people and children, which is where you know, my heart and passion is. Um, every time I come up, I, I say things to you, and I don't know that we've ever had an opportunity for you to ask questions. I know you ask questions of the other people. Are there questions that you have about any of these three things or anything? I think one reason is because you do an excellent job of, of explaining in detail. So maybe a question I had and then two sentences later that you answered it. But does anybody have any specific questions today? Okay. I, I just wanted to have a Chambers? comment. I, I so appreciate you speaking your truth and talking. The, these past few months have been hard for everybody, but no more than a teacher that is sitting here with us, an active teacher in the district. One, I wanted to thank you for being such a, um, a thoughtful, open human being to share your thoughts and perspectives. That's not easy. And to thank you for continuing to be a part of this work. We all come at this differently. We have different experiences. And I think one of the best things we can do right now for the students of Arkansas is to not give up because it gets discouraging. So stay in there and thank you for everything that you're doing and being a part of this. Thank you, Ms. Chambers. Anybody else? Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Moore, did you have anything to report today? Mr. Williamson, Ms. McBedridge, thank you for bringing Dr. Rollins in. Um, uh, Ms. Newton covered uh, what I was going to cover from uh, uh, the support unit, so I do appreciate that. I know they're excited about um, getting those things out as much as three months early. That's, that's impressive. Uh, as far as the special ed, uh, one of the exciting things around students was 50 of the high school students with disabilities were able to attend the one week short film camp in Bentonville, and that went really, really well for them. And um, they have gotten the Little Rock School District back on the schedule to do the training for uh, their assistant principals in improving the quality of the IEP conferences. Um, this is the last month with our MOU with uh, Forward, and I think probably all of you know that um, Ms. Harriman uh, 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 left there uh, December 
uh, fourth uh, health issues within the family, uh, and uh, the interim is going to be Corey Anderson, and I think a lot of you know him from the Rockefeller Institute. So uh, we wish them well as they go forward. So, uh, Commissioner. All right. So um, I'll start at the center of the universe. Uh, El Dorado, according to uh, <laughs> Mr. Williamson and uh, your uh, former board, your former colleague Alice Mahoney, and anybody else that uh, comes from down there. Uh, Dr. Maria Markham with Higher Ed and I visited South Arkansas Community College um, last month, and so I just took a few pictures because what they uh, they showed us was their uh, a lot of their offerings in career and technical education, of course. They, uh, they do have a number of other traditional offerings, but what I saw there was a very strong partnership between uh, the, the regional employers and that college to try to enhance uh, the pathways for students, just like you heard uh, Joe Rollins talking about today. So, you know, I'm glad to know that, you know, the connection of that tool and then moving that maybe to other regions because there are some great things in place. So this is, uh, you think about, okay, that just is a tanker car. It looks like it'd be in a rail yard. Well, actually it's in the backyard of the, uh, on the campus of uh, South Arkansas Community College. Uh, Dalek used to be Lion Oil. Uh, so Lion Oil a few years ago uh, was bought out, uh, but that did not change the partnership uh, approach uh, so uh, there are things that kid that students need to know before they go into some of these um, these these roles. What struck me about this was it took me back to my days at Union Carbide, in because I, one of the jobs in my uh, internship there was a, a product that we had to figure out how to load onto tank cars, and uh, so I didn't climb on top. Uh, so don't. Don't uh, don't think I'd put my life at risk of doing anything that that like that. Uh, and then Dan, go to the next slide. Uh, this was another. Uh, this is a simulator, but uh, if you look here, I mean, it, it, all of the the systems that the students need to know before they go onto a factory floor or uh, into a, a plant or into a facility uh, that you know this was donated by one of the local. Uh, manufacturer one of the local companies um, and, and it gives them kind of a real uh, real life opportunity to know uh, on a smaller scale where uh, where the critical nature where the critical parts are for the process and they're learning that as they're there on the campus and, um, and with a safe product you're not yes transporting yeah. water yeah. In this. Yeah, exactly <laughs> you know hydrocarbons under pressure and, and all that so. right yes yeah uh, yeah, good, good point. Uh, and then on to the next one. All right. So also that uh, that tank uh, tanker truck, the trailer there that you see. I mean, every component that maybe uh, a student may interact with on the job, they bring there so they they can see it. And it's and it's not just technical. There are, uh, there are a number of academic applications that uh, so you know for anyone to think well they're just training people how to uh, turn valves and things like that no that's not it at all and some of these other pictures will kind of indicate that um, this is inside the building those other pictures were outside this is actually inside the building and there are a number of small-scale simulators uh, that uh, are on this floor where students get the opportunity to interact directly with it uh, so whether it's a, uh, you know, whether it's a pump, whether it's a heat exchanger, that uh, uh, piece of equipment on the table there on the right side, that is a, a model heat exchanger. But all the math, all the science is the same at that scale as it is on the bigger scale. And students are learning about that. Okay, Dan, go ahead. Uh, and this is just another, another picture of that. Um, Cooling towers, okay, if you, uh, when you park out back and you walk by that uh, big cooling tower that's uh, out there on the left as you're coming down the parking lot, okay, so this is a small scale of that, but again, all of the math, all the science 
uh, applies, and this is where they learn it, uh, so then they can go and apply it when they get out uh, on the, in the workplace, okay? And then we followed up, uh, or ended the day at the South Arkansas Community College board meeting, uh, and these students represent some of the $750,000 in scholarships that come from the state of Arkansas. Um, the thing to note about that amount is that it is uh, relatively small uh, as opposed to some of the other schools around the state and the reason it is relatively small is because of the community and the Murphy uh, promise, the Eldorado promise uh, and the commitment of Murphy and the other organizations that support that. Uh, so it's um, just South Arkansas is creating opportunity. You know, we visited El Dorado Public Schools a couple of years ago, and uh, I just wanted to, as a follow-up to that, to show you all some of the other things that are happening on the higher ed uh, side of education there. All right, and uh, let's move on. This is, uh, okay, so Ms. Newton was uh, referring to our trip to South Pike County, Murfreesboro High School. Um, and these are the students that uh, won the app challenge, Congressional App Challenge, pictured here with Congressman Westerman. Uh, but they won the app challenge, and uh, as, uh, as you know, those of you who are educators can relate to the challenge that they were trying to solve, which is simple thing of checking a student out. And um, they, they developed an app where they uh, the clipboards are gone and the phone calls of uh, from one building to the, to the other that says hey is is uh, you know is, is Johnny checked out today and well I don't know I have to go look and it takes a long they developed an app where instantly they know um, when somebody checks out and it uh, populates a, a uh, it was a Google spreadsheet is that right Ms. Newton I think it was and so every office has access to that Pretty you simple. Have and, the in the video, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, the description I can't give the description that's worthy. But the two young men uh, was it was very interesting because uh, the young man on the left is a senior, and he is uh, he knows what he wants to do. And I've never met a young man at 17 years old that says he wants to be an actuary, but that's what he wants to do. He wants to be an actuary. Um, the young man on the right, who is a sophomore, I believe, and he want, he was uh, very afraid to say anything uh, to us. He, he really didn't want to get up in front of us at all, uh, which is ironic because he wants to be an FBI agent. Um, and, but, but, you know, the interesting thing is he wants to be an FBI agent focused on cybersecurity, uh, which was very appropriate given uh, you know, the work that we're doing in the state with respect to computer science. Uh, the, the overall day, though, that was just one part of it. These two young men were singled out for the app challenge, but um, to add on to what Ms. Newton said, you know, we got to see how they created a lesson where the students were directly involved in their learning, going to old Washington State Park, learning about, and, and not only learning, but being able to present on the judiciary branch um, the, and going to the old courthouse there at Old Washington and using their, um, their tablet to, and then using the technology to create that lesson. The teacher created that lesson, but then the students had a, a role in enhancing and being a part of that lesson. We saw that all through the school and all grades. So the, both the elementary and the high school are now uh, Apple schools of distinction um, and again as Ms. Newton said the only two in the state of Arkansas and one of uh, fewer than 500 uh, in the whole country or in the whole world around the world uh, so that was a, a good trip um, the uh, did, were there any other pictures on that Dan no okay all right uh, a couple of other things so I wanted to let y'all know uh, CCSSO will be hosting next month a literacy summit uh, or uh, a convening and um, Carissa um, has asked or the executive director has asked me to be uh, a part of the panel there because of the work that Arkansas has been doing uh, so it, uh, it's an opportunity for us to highlight 
you know, the, the work here and how it relates uh, to all phases of education. So I'm excited about that. CCSSO has taken a very um, decided and strong stance with respect to science of reading. Uh, Emily Hanford, the, uh, who has re written recently about um, our nationwide deficiencies in reading and why that's the case is going to be part of this as well. Uh, so it's not just work in Arkansas, it really is work around all the 50 states um, that we have to do things differently and have to do things better. Uh, so I'm excited to have that opportunity. And then uh, as a future initiative, uh, we, you're aware, you are aware of the AWARE grant, you know, the, uh, the mental health grant that we've been, uh, the team's been working on. But this fall, as we've been out in the schools, um, around at the co-ops, it's just um, more and more apparent that mental health is a challenge that our, uh, our schools are not equipped to handle uh, the, the growing need. And just as an example, you know, Ivy and I were at the Dawson co-op and a lot of the superintendents were asking, they were describing the challenges, and then as we've listened to other members of the team who have been out at co-ops, it's very consistent. The, the, the students that have these challenges where in the past maybe it was one in a grade or one in a classroom, it's two, three, four in a classroom. Um, and we are going to work to bring together multiple agencies because this is not just an education issue. It is a, is, it's really a state issue um, weaving throughout a number of agencies and, and organizations. And we're going to start working on uh, bringing even more focus uh, on this effort. So there, just know, put it in the back of your mind, there's going to be uh, a lot of work that happens over the next few months. And uh, Stacy and her team are at the forefront of this, but it's not just state. I mean, it's, it's kind of an all hands on deck issue and I just want to give you a heads up of that so you know when you start hearing things that uh, you know what what will this bring a need for rule changes will it bring the need for legislative changes uh, will it bring the need for funding changes all the above could be on the table and you you may have a uh, critical role in that as we bring these things to, to you I know based on some pilot projects that were done a few years ago they uh, in fact documented that as more students learn to read trauma goes down referrals to uh, the counselor's office go down attendance goes up so I think in concert with what we've already got going with rise that that will play nicely into uh, the, the other forms um, I know yesterday there was a to Ms. McBetry's point, uh, CTE in, com in concert with economic developers, business people, uh, administrators, uh, had a meeting and it was in a room that'll seat about 110. It was a standing room only. Uh, Mr. Key did, or Secretary Key did the uh, introduction and then he raced over here to <laughs> be with us. But uh, from all accounts, it was a huge success and, and uh, a good type, and they, that group is involved also in the Perkins Five that you ho heard uh, Dr. Kramer's talking about, so we'll hear more about that. Um, any new business? No, but I would like to say one thing. Please. Okay. Um, Dr. Megan Slocum, who was um, representing the Fayetteville Virtual Academy yesterday, wanted to make sure we understood that she was on the phone for a while to answer any questions about her waiver, but she got pulled away because she was presenting at the Arkansas School Board Association, so she was concerned that we thought she was being disrespectful. No. So I told her I would let everyone know what happened. So You tell her we absolutely thought the worst of her, so. <laughs> no, that's But that was fault. a great concern to her, so yeah. I'm okay. glad to bring uh, that message. I only have one signed up for public comment, Gary Newton. Before you do that, I did have one. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. That's okay. Um, yesterday, I believe it was the superintendent that was here from Earl, Arkansas, and um, Blonde. Mm -hmm. yes, uh -huh. and so she had a group of students, and not just her, but she specifically had a group of students that participated in the student voice 
um, Institute, and I meant to say something about that yesterday. So I would hope that maybe in the future, and maybe not necessarily just Earl, but if we could have some of the students that um, that have participated in the student in, in Student Voice Institute to come up and maybe just kind of share some of Absolutely. what that's about. I think that would be a wonderful <coughs> presentation for the board. That'd be good. And I know when we had the SS Steering Committee, they had a student mm -hmm. deliberately, uh, uh, the commissioner made sure that there was that, and he, he gave a, a lot of good contributions. Of course, you know, he's gone on to college now. He may be out by now. I don't know. He, he was missed the finals. That's all he needed. Yeah, well, <laughs> at least he gets his priorities right. That's right. Okay. Okay, Mr. Newton. Thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board. Uh, forgive me, make, I want to make sure to, to include all the points by reading here. Uh, the continued misinformation delivered from this microphone without challenge is divisive and disturbing. Had the earlier referenced equity tour been held in 2016, it would have been to Cloverdale and Henderson, which was then West Little Rock's zoned middle school. If in 2014, it would have been to Cloverdale and pre-reconstitution Forest Heights, which was then West Little Rock's zoned middle school. It is impossible to build an old building. Pinnacle View, is the district's largest, highest performing, and most diverse middle school. It was created from a repurposed warehouse at a fraction of the cost it would have been to build from the ground up. A true equity tour would have been to the $105 million Southwest High School and the empty 40 acres purchased in 2013 for the non-existent West Little Rock High School. Had Little Rock voters not opposed the proposed millage extension, Cloverdale would have already been replaced and all of LRSD facilities would have been refurbished. I recommend that if anyone wants a real equity tour, they should travel from Southwest, Little, from Southwest High School, which I and West Little Rock voters supported, then to Hall, until yesterday, West Little Rock's zoned high school. Then, please explain that inequity. Thank you very much. You're very welcome. I see no other public comment. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. See you all next month. Have a